Galatians 5 in your Bibles. This evening, looking at verses 19 through 25, the title of the message, They That Are Christ's. Last week, uh, I kind of left you hanging. We explored Galatians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18, and in doing so, we considered the superiority of grace to the law in, in literally every respect. That everything that the law would seek to accomplish with respect to moralizing a man, to making a man uh, someone who is, is lined up with God's moral standard, Everything that the law can accomplish with respect to moralizing men is, is accomplished through grace completely apart from the guilt and the condemnation that the law brings. Remember, we went to Romans chapters 7 and 8, where we learned of Paul's frustration with the flesh, but that those frustrations were tied to the law. And when we continued reading in chapter 8, we found that the Spirit of God frees the believer from the condemnation and frustration of the cycle of sin and the condemnation and frustration that the law brings. Um, brings to our knowledge of sin. When Paul mused about the good that he would do, which he did not do, he was not musing about uh, victory in Christ, but of the frustration when he was living under the condemnation of sin that the law induced, that he knew he was a sinner, and when he lived under the law, it brought nothing but frustration and sin because it showed him his failings, his weakness, his incapacity. But where the Spirit is, Paul said, there is no condemnation. It doesn't change the fact that we have a flesh. It doesn't change the fact that we sin. But it changes everything when it comes to our victory over the flesh. And tonight we're going to finish our thoughts from last week. And as we do so, we will understand the biblical keys to living free from the law while also living free from sin. Free from the condemnation and guilt, but alive unto righteousness through Jesus Christ. And the first order of business is to know what we are talking about. What are the things that are accomplished in the flesh, and what are the things that comprise the Spirit? And here's why. Because if we don't know what comes out of us when we are in the flesh, or what comes out of us when we are walking in the Spirit, then we won't be able to gauge how we are doing in relation to the flesh or the Spirit. But if you know what is the flesh and you know what is the Spirit, then at any given point in the day, you can assess the fruit of your actions. And by assessing the fruit of your actions, you can know whether or not you're walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit. All right. Be a year or two more before you can preach, little bud. And so let's read verses 19 through 25 together, and then we'll talk about them before systematically uh, discussing how it is we can take our knowledge and turn it into our victory. Beginning in verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You notice I didn't read verse 26. We'll pick up with verse 26 as a part of Galatians 6 next week. In 
chapter 19, we read this introductory phrase to the flesh and the spirit. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Within the context, Paul has told us that the flesh, remember, is lusting against the spirit, and the spirit is lusting against the flesh. There is a battle raging inside of you, and these two components are fighting each other. Your sin nature and the new nature that is in Christ are in contention. And he said in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That if you're walking in the Spirit of God, then you are not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there is a way, Paul indicates, to live outside of, or if we may put it this way, to live above, to live transcendent from the flesh and the sin which would seek to ravage us and to leave us ineffective for Christ. So the question then becomes, how can we know whether or not at any given moment we are fulfilling the lust of the flesh or we are walking in the Spirit? And the answer is this. What's coming out of your life? That will tell you. Am I walking in the flesh or am I walking in the Spirit? What's coming out of your life? If you're living in the flesh, what will come out of you? Any or all of the actions or emotions that are found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And that list is fairly comprehensive. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. And then he says, and such like, and things like that. Let's walk through them. We're not necessarily going to walk through them um, uh, super comprehensively uh, in each one. We'll walk through them thematically, but also talk about what each one does mean. So the end of verse 19 gives us this first four, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. The first set of fleshly lusts that we look at deals directly with sexual sin. All four of these are dealing directly with sexual sin. Adultery. This is the sexual violation of a marriage covenant where a man or a woman vows exclusivity with their spouse. The scripture tells us that marriage was the first institution created by God. And because it is a creation of God, mankind has no capacity to define it or to redefine it. Not what it is, nor its Terms. And we get caught up today on redefining what marriage is. We know the Bible teaches that marriage is one man and one woman for life. And society around us is seeking to redefine marriage and to make it anything plus anything for any uh, period of time. And we know that to be true. But it's not just the definition of marriage that is given by God, but it's also the terms of marriage. And God tells us that marriage is an exclusive relationship where by the husband and the wife have exclusive rights to one another and in one of the areas where they have exclusive rights the primary area where where they have exclusive rights one to another is in the area of sexuality now god has built into mankind in general a sexual appetite this appetite is designed to encourage human race to reproduce, to be sustained, and it is well there for our pleasure, for our benefit, for our, to, to bless us. And God has designed this appetite to be satisfied within the bounds of the marriage relationship. That is the context within which God has designed this appetite to be satisfied. A man and woman bind themselves to mutual exclusivity and to mutual loyalty. And God has designed uh, this so that there would be this institution, the, the protection and the defense of this institution, which he has ordained, called marriage. Just as God has given mankind this sexual appetite... He has likewise given mankind a righteous, God-honoring way to satisfy the appetite. Adultery is when a man or a woman goes outside of that exclusive marriage relationship in order to satisfy this appetite. Now fornication, the second term, 
It's a far more broad word in the Greek. It's the word porneia. It's actually the word from which we get our word pornography. But it, it simply speaks of sexual misconduct. The unrighteous fulfilling of one's sexual appetite. Uh, and and it, it could be used within the context of those who are married or those that are unmarried with kind of leaning toward that idea where adultery would be within the confines of the marriage relationship and fornication would be, perhaps we might say, outside of those confines. It speaks of any satisfaction of that sexual appetite that God has given to us apart from God's design, apart from God's intended method of fulfillment. This is a, a very broad un umbrella term for sexual activity outside of the blessing and outside of the sanction of marriage. The third term, uncleanness, carries the specific idea of impurity as it relates to morality. Uh, uncleanness would be, uh, in a man, would be kind of what we call the dirty mind or the dirty person. That person that is just, that's just immoral, dirty, uh, they, they, all their, they, they say, hey, you want to hear a joke? And you say, no, I don't want to hear a joke coming out of your mouth because I know what that joke is going to be about. You're sitting down and you say something and they twist it to make it dirty. You had no intention, but they, they just, everything they do, it just twists into something dirty, something immoral, something wrong. That's uncleanness. And the final word here is lasciviousness, uncontrolled lust. All of the words in our King James Bible, um, I, I, what, I, what I appreciate about them is that they are very specific. They go far more specific than many of the words that we um, would use in today's English. However, um, this is the one that would be also most foreign to us. It carries the idea of unbridled, uninhibited lust, uh, extreme looseness of lifestyle or character, almost an animal-like character, just it, if it feels good, do it type thing. And amazingly enough, this is becoming very prevalent, is it not, in our society? It used to be that lascivious people um, were, were kind of the outcasts, even of a, of a fairly depraved society, they would be the outcasts. Those would be the people that take it too far. Well, now there's no such thing as too far. That's because our entire culture has fallen into lasciviousness. It is an animal-like culture where almost anything can be justified. Even, even heinous awful, wicked, unnatural acts, sexual acts, will find justification in our culture if you look for it. And that's lasciviousness. A person who is morally out of control. Now, as we consider these four words, we find that, uh, that every sexual activity outside of God's design is, is really well covered as an activity that is an outworking of the flesh. Sexual activity outside of God's design in marriage is an outworking of the flesh. The sexual relationship is righteous within its designed context. And throughout history, Satan has found a very strong stronghold in the world through sexual misconduct of all sorts. Pagan religions, occultic practices regularly involve illicit sexual rituals and misconduct. One of the most obvious and consistent traits of a culture that has rejected God is the strong sexualization of the culture. The more people are comfortable with nakedness, the more people are comfortable speaking and re referencing sexuality, the, the deeper you know that culture has found itself into a denial of God, of His existence, and His authority. And on that scale, our culture's in a pretty bad way today, is it not? And it's not the first time that cultures have been where we are. You read about ancient Roman culture, Greek culture, even um, the, you can even read it in the Word of God in the book of Judges about uh, the culture of the Jews. It was not more than one generation after they entered into the land of Canaan, after Moses and Joshua. It was, it was not more than, than a generation or two after that that we find the city of the Benjamites that is so deep into sodomy that they didn't want anything but men, sodomite relationships in that city. I mean, we're talking a couple of generations after Joshua and Moses. 
And so we see it time and time again that as people reject the knowledge of the living God, they fall into sexual sin. And it's of the flesh. The Western world calls the past 50 years a part of the sexual revolution. It is, in fact, the denigration of culture and society and a regression of the civilization that we have built into its pagan roots. In verse 20, we see the next grouping. So the first grouping was sexual sin. If, if it's anything outside of the confines of the marriage relationship, then it's an outworking of the flesh. You know that. If, if you are doing anything, any sort of sexual misconduct, any sort of sexuality outside of one man and one woman for life, then you can know right away you're, you're walking in the flesh. It's a given. The next batch, idolatry and witchcraft. Idolatry and witchcraft are, are very strongly associated in the Bible. Idolatry is the worship of false gods, giving worship to some object or person which is not the true and living God. We often think of idols only as little statues which people worship, but we must understand idolatry is a much larger issue than that. Money is an idol which many, many people worship. This coming election kind of makes that clear, doesn't it? There's several people that are running for president in 2016 who the major talking points is, I'm going to give you money. You're going to get money out of me. And people are willing to throw their uh, support behind a politician for the sole reason that they think they're going to get a bunch of money out of it. That's an idolatry problem. Which um, uh, celebrities are idols which many people worship? Maybe musicians, movie stars, sports figures, sports teams. There's a show on called American Idol, right? That's not obvious. <laughs> We're, we're about to come to one of the most idolatrous days of the year. The Super Bowl is in just a few weeks. One of the most idolatrous days of the year as millions of people bow before their idol of this culture, spend their money, their time, their effort, invest emotionally in a game. Anything that a person places higher in value or priority than God has effectively become an idol to them. And if you are living out idolatry in your life, then what you can know is that in that particular way that you are living out idolatry, you're walking in the flesh. Witchcraft. Witchcraft is, in, in large part, kind of a subset of idolatry. Uh, whereas idolatry is placing anything higher than God, witchcraft is the practicing of the occult, the worshiping of Satan himself. It's not necessarily just taking an idol, uh, anything, and making it God. It is actually acknowledging Satan as God. It is acknowledging Satan as the, the, the Most High. It is the, is the purest form of Satan's rebellion against God. Whereas Satan is more than comfortable just to have people wallowing in idolatry. He's more than comfortable to have them worshiping a rock or worshiping a stone or worshiping a piece of wood or worshiping a, a splinter of a piece of wood or worshiping a musician or worshiping a, a, a celebrity of, of some other sort. He's more than happy to, to get those, but then there's, there's another group that he's able to get. And that group, it, it, they, they throw away all pretenses. And they are literally worshiping Satan. And they're doing so specifically for the promise of power that Satan will give them. That's witchcraft. Satan wants the power for himself. And witchcraft is the means by which Satan is directly worshipped. And anytime we fall into idolatry or witchcraft, we are feeding the flesh. We are walking in the flesh, not in the spirit. The next group in verse 20. Hatred. Variance emulations, and wrath. This third set of fleshly exhibitions deals with the emotions and their outworking. Hatred. This is overt hostility. The Bible tells us that God is a God of peace. We see several times the concept of peace brought up in relation to the Christian life. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peace makers. 
in the armor of God. We are to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hatred is the opposite of that. Reacting in hostility, living in hostility. When you are living in hostility, you are living in the flesh. You know what that means? That means road rage is an outworking of the flesh. That's hostility. It's a hostility that's working up in you. It's the flesh. When you feel that, you know the flesh is trying to come on. Variance. Variance, this is arguing. This is when, when you're varying with someone else. That's the idea here. An argumentative nature is the naturally, natural outworking of a sin nature, of the flesh. If you are an argumentative person, you might have a flesh problem. Because argue, being naturally argumentative, not seeking for that which is conducive to peace and unity, but seeking to, to split, seeking to, um, to dis divide, that's a fleshly thing. Emulations. This was an interesting one to me. Even though I've gone through this list many times, this one stuck out to me this time. And I think it's because of, of where I am in, in my, my fathering right now. Emulations. This is, a, this is seeking to rival others. I have twin girls. I have twin girls. They are steeped in this fleshly problem of emulation. They are constantly rivaling one another. They don't care about a toy until sister has the toy, and then it's got to be their toy. That's emulations. That's this natural rivalry, this selfishness, this I'm better than you, I'm going to be better than you, I'm going to be superior to you, I'm going to show you how I'm better than you. We often don't think of rivalries necessarily as a fleshly thing, uh, but, but it is. Paul puts it in this list, emulations, trying to rival people all the time. Anything you can do, I can do better. Watch me. I'm better than you. It's flesh. Wrath. This is, this is uh, violent anger. This is anger in its most intense degree. Uh, anger that is acted upon in some way. When you act upon your anger, that's wrath. And when you act in anger, whether that's a parent disciplining in anger, whether that's a sibling acting on another sibling in anger, whether that's that vindictive nature of, I'm going to get you back. Not in jest, of course, but, you know, legitimate vind vindication and, and vindictiveness. It's the flesh. This third category is all about allowing our emotions to drive us. And particularly our negative emotions, what we would call our negative emotions to drive us. This is when our emotions are in the driver's seat. You're going to feel these, aren't you? You're going to feel these. You're going to want to rival someone one time. You're going to want to, to, to be at variance with someone. You're going to want to be hostile. You're going to want to be angry. But when you allow that emotion to work itself out, when you give that emotion the capacity to control you, you are being controlled by your flesh. Next part of the list in verse 20 as well. Strife, seditions, and heresies. This set deal with your actions in groups and particular emphasis on your action in the body of Christ. Strife speaks of a spirit that would seek to fracture relationships through lies and through intrigue. Seditions is the stirring up of emotional sentiment against the truth. So strife, you're using intrigue and deception to try to fracture people. Lies. You're, you're, you're bringing lies into a relationship in order to tear people apart that wouldn't normally be torn apart. And, and you're doing so through, through lies, through, through, through intrigue. Um, seditions, that's, that's um, stirring up sentiment against the truth. This is um, um, the idea of, of kind of uh, working people up into a false frenzy over false concepts. If you want good examples of these, look no further than the aisles of our government. Our government, just, just watch a debate. 
read the news one day and you will find strife and sedition everywhere. People tearing one another down, people destroying one another, people seeking the destruction of another person simply in the quest for their own program, their own priorities. It's just disgusting. It's sin. It's the flesh. Heresies are divisive errors. Particularly in the religious context, those things which are contrary to the truth but claimed in order to get others to follow. Each of these manifestations of a fleshly motive are found as men persist in dividing others, not along lines of truth, but for selfish personal reasons. Truth divides, does it not? But the flesh is about dividing through error. Or, or leading into error. In verse 21, we see the next group, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Envy is uneasiness or unhappiness at the general success or happiness of others. When you look at someone else and they are being successful and you kind of wish they weren't, or you wish that you were more successful, or you look at them and you resent them a little bit because of the successes that they've had, that's envy. Murder is the unlawful taking of a human life. It's different from killing. It's different from some, some justified forms of killing. Murder is when unlawfully, unjustifiably taking of a human life. Drunkenness is allowing yourself to be under the influence and particularly uh, the idea is intoxication, uh, being under the influence not necessarily just of alcohol but of, of any mind-altering drug. Revelings is being a part of riotous actions, either riot-like actions or riot-like celebrations as we see it in scripture. So being a part of a mob of destructive riotous people wanting to to go along with a destructive riotous spirit that's the flesh and if you see any of these things working themselves out in you what you are seeing work out in you is the flesh your sin nature and Paul is careful to place within the context a phrase, this particular phrase, and such like, and other things like these. See other things like these, right? It's not an exhaustive list that Paul has given us, but it is sufficient to give you the character and the types of actions that are clearly driven by the flesh. Actions that are motivated by self above others. Actions that seek to harm others. Actions that work contrary to the will and word of God. These are fleshly actions. When you see these things working themselves out in your life, here's what you can know. If you are acting upon these sorts of things, you are walking in the flesh. On the contrary... Verses 22 and 23 tell us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And he says, against such there is no law. There is no law that prohibits anything on that list. Now, there are laws that prohibit Christianity around the world. But, as a wise man once said, Nobody in the world hates the fruit of Christianity. They only hate the doctrines of Christianity. Everybody wants the fruit of what Christians have. They just don't want the truth of what Christians have. It's important to mention the vital difference between the lust of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. James chapter 1 verses 13 to 15 tell us, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust 
and entice. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The scriptures tell us that lust is what draws us into temptation. Temptation is not in itself a sin. It is not a sin to be tempted to do wrong. It is a sin to yield to that temptation. This is very important, children. Very important adults, too. But children, get this. It is not a sin when you are tempted to do wrong. It is not a sin just because there's something welling up in you that wants to lie, that wants to cheat, that wants to steal, that desires to envy, that wants to um, be at variance, that wants to get angry. Um, there's not, it's not a sin to have that well up in you because that's the flesh. You have that. You're, 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 you're always going to have the flesh. That's temptation. That is tempting you to act upon your flesh. It becomes sin when we yield to it. And it works in us. Death. The lust of the flesh are those things which the flesh wants us to do. And when we yield to the lust of the flesh one of those elements of the flesh will come out. Maybe it's a sexual sin. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's divisiveness. Maybe it's idolatry. And maybe as you've tried to deny one of those lusts, another one pops up. If you're living in the flesh and you try to squelch one area of your flesh in your own power, it's like a whack-a-mole. You whack one down and another one pops up. We can't do it. You can't just say, I'm going to stop materialism. And so as you're pushing materialism down, some other area of the flesh is just going to bubble right back up if you're doing it in yourself. This is characteristic that you're living a life of the flesh and trying to solve your sin problem through your own efforts. But as we consider the fruit of the Spirit... We understand that just as the lusts of the flesh are the natural outworking of when we yield to our temptations, the fruit of the Spirit is the natural outworking of when you yield to the Holy Ghost of God. And this is important. The fruit of the Spirit is not something that you can conjure up within yourself. You can't just wake up one day and say, well, I need to be loving, so I'm going to be loving. Well, I need to be long-suffering, so I'm going to be long-suffering. Well, I'm going, I need to be gentle, so I'm going to be gentle. I'll just flip a switch and I'll be gentle today. It's not like that. The fruit of the Spirit is the natural effect of yielding to the Spirit of God. Just as the works of the flesh are the natural effect of yielding to the flesh. You are tempted to yield to the flesh, but at the same moment that you are regarding that temptation to do wrong, the Spirit of God in you is calling you to do right. And that's the moment of decision. That's the moment of volition. That is where you are going to exercise your will. And you are going to yield to the Spirit of God or you are going to yield to the flesh. And as you are tempted to do wrong, there's the Spirit of God in you that's calling you to do right. And whichever one you yield to is going to produce in you its effect. It's not about what you are doing. It's about who you are obeying. And we need to understand it this way. We need to understand the actions that we are committing as either obeying the flesh or obeying the Spirit. That we are yielding to the power of the flesh or we are yielding to the power of the Spirit. And then the flesh or the Spirit is simply working in us that which we have yielded unto. Are you obeying your lusts or are you obeying the Spirit? When you obey your lusts, the result is sin. When you obey the Spirit, the, the results are righteousness. So let's talk about these righteous results. The first one on the list is love. Biblical love is totally different from what the world calls love. What we might call Disney love. Follow your heart. Trust your feelings. Something you fall into and out of. To the world, love is a feeling. In the Bible, love is a choice. 
To the world, love can come and go. In the Bible, love is intended to be constant and true. To the world, love is dependent upon how a person treats you or how well things are going at that time. In the Bible, love operates outside of how you are treated or the circumstances within which you find yourself. At Legacy Baptist Church, we define love, and we did it not long ago. Let's do it again. We define love as the unconditional choice to do what is best for the one who is loved or the object of your love, regardless of self-interest and regardless of circumstances. And this is the love that manifests itself through you as you obey the Spirit of God. So you can't say that, that a person who has yielded himself to the world's definition of love is walking in the Spirit. That's, that's not what this is saying. But when you see the true definition of love working itself out in someone, it's reflecting the truth of God. Joy. Joy is not happiness. Did you know that? Joy is not happiness. Happiness is based upon circumstances. Joy is un, an unshakable state of peace, an unshakable contentment that is greater than circumstances and rests upon our knowledge of God and our eternal understanding of God and, and of heaven. In 1 John 1, we find the evangelist wrote that we might have fullness of joy through a th thriving relationship with Jesus Christ we can have fullness of joy, John told us. And it's a joy that manifests itself in our lives naturally as we submit to the Spirit of God. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about things that strip me of my joy. And it tends to be when I allow circumstances to dictate me. It tends to be when something goes wrong with the car or something goes wrong with the house or something goes wrong with my health or my children's health and I start to fret and I start to, to, to worry and I start to get anxious and I just turn into a heaping puddle of mess. There's no doubt when I'm there that I'm walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. Because if I were walking in the spirit, I would be joyful. Peace. Peace is confidence regardless of circumstances. Peace is that which allows the believer to rest in God and to trust in Him. Peace is not found in physical prosperity, but rather a trust in God and in His perfect plan. Peace is also a, a peacefulness, a desire unto peace. Long-suffering. This is patience. The word is, it means what it, what it is, <laughs> to suffer long. Suffering is when you're in a place that is certainly not where you'd want to be. It could be emotional suffering, it could be physical suffering, and yet you are willing to suffer long. You're patient with people that are hard to be patient with. It's long suffering. That is an outworking of the Spirit of God. Gentleness, soft of manner, mild of temper, sweet of disposition. Goodness, being kind to people. Faith, the capacity to trust God in the midst of whatever circumstances. Meekness, strength under control, not weakness. But when you are guiding and directing your strength into positive and proper means and outcomes. Temperance. This is control over your actions, thoughts, reactions, and indulgences. Self-control. Now as we consider this list, it is important to note that to some degree, have you ever seen one of these traits in an unbeliever? I have. You know they're an unbeliever, but you know what? They're a pretty temperate person. You know they're an unbeliever, but they're a very gentle person. Or they're a very kind person. But these things always have their limits in unbelievers. And they are produced by the person himself. 
in the believer, these actions aren't produced by us. They are produced in us as we yield to the Spirit of God. In the unbeliever, they are conjured up by the unbeliever himself. And so they always have limits. And by being conjured up by the unbeliever himself, we will also find that by conjuring this sort of action, what they are typically doing is appeasing their flesh. They're seeking some way to appease the guilt of sin and to appease their flesh by some perception of moral righteousness in one of these traits. And you certainly won't find them all in an unbeliever. So there we have it. Through these verses, we know how to identify when we are yielding to the flesh and when we are yielding to the Spirit. When we're yielding to the flesh, the works of the flesh are manifest. When we're yielding to the Spirit, the works of the Spirit are manifest. Paul then says in verses 24 and 25, They that are, in, that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Those who are followers of Christ, to those who are followers of Christ, it is expected that you would have a crucified flesh. A flesh that is dead to you. That in identifying with the death of Christ through salvation and then through uh, the... the public testimony of believers' baptism, you have declared that you are living or that you are doing your best. You are going to seek to live yielded to the Spirit of God and not to the flesh of God, dead to your lusts and alive unto Christ. And so Paul says, if you are living in the Spirit of God by virtue of your salvation, then you ought to walk in the Spirit of God. If you identify with Christ, then submit yourself to Christ. Now by saying this, we must understand that it is possible for a believer to be living in the Spirit, but not walking in the Spirit. This is important. Paul wouldn't have given this verse if it was by default that if you're a believer, then you're going to always walk in the Spirit. It's very important for you, again, young people, to understand as you get into your teenage years and you start to deal with the reality of your sin and, and, and um, desires begin to awaken you and, and a, a self-consciousness that makes you uh, be very capable of manipulating and lying and cheating and, and, and these sorts of things and, and, and the temptation to do so is placed before you in, in new ways. You must understand that it is possible for you as a believer to be living in the Spirit, in other words, to be saved, but not to walk in the Spirit. That you have to yield yourself to the Spirit of God. But of course, this is easier said than done. So with the rest of our time together today, we are going to talk about how to make this happen. How do we walk in the Spirit? How do we resist the flesh? That's going to be our application this evening. How to overcome the flesh. Number one, know what is the flesh and what is the spirit. The first step is the one that we have just covered together. Isn't that great? We've already covered the first step. We've got it covered. You know what is flesh. You know what is spirit. You know the manifestations of the flesh. You know the manifestations of the spirit. You know on a daily basis the actions you take. Whether or not those actions are fleshly actions or spirit-driven actions. If you don't know what is right and what is wrong, then you can't know whether or not you're doing right or doing wrong. And so now you know that. Now you know what is flesh and you know what is spirit. The lusts of the flesh are those thoughts and actions which are derived from our sin nature when we yield to temptation and we allow the, the temptation, the lust of our flesh, to work itself out into unrighteousness. The fruit of the spirit are those thoughts and actions that are derived from the Spirit of God and they work themselves out in righteousness. So, how to overcome the flesh? Well, first, know what is the flesh, know what is the Spirit. We, we, we've got that. We've done that. Number two, you need to assume the mindset. Assume the mindset of the believer. Pastor, what is the mindset of the believer? You know, if, if we sin when we yield to temptation and yielding to temptation is an act of the will, then we, we understand that the battle with the flesh is won or lost in our mind far more than it is in our actions. It's won or lost the moment we have chosen to entertain the temptation. It is won or lost when we have chosen to entertain the lust. 
it is not necessarily always an action. You know, I can lust in my heart. I can sin in my heart. I can entertain wickedness in my heart without it ever actually getting into my hands. And so it's in the mind where the battle truly rages. Our mind is the seat of our will. It's the seat of our volition. That means if the flesh or the spirit desire to control us, the center of that control will be in our mind. So if you want to win the battle, you need to win it in your mind. How do you do that? Well, number one, you need to know that the flesh is conquered. You must know that the flesh is conquered. You must assume that this knowledge, that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior by placing your full faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, then the flesh has already been conquered. You may be allowing it to rule, but you are allowing it to rule. It has no authority to rule in your life. Did you know that? If you are a born-again believer, if you have accepted Jesus Christ by grace through faith, then the flesh has no authority to rule in your life. In Romans chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, Paul says this, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. It is imperative that we understand that our flesh is conquered. It has no power over you any longer if you are in Christ. The necessary step on your part then is to reckon yourselves, to assume the mindset that says, I am dead to sin. A millionaire can live as a pauper if he doesn't reckon himself rich. A talented athlete can squander his capabilities if he doesn't reckon himself as capable. And a free man can live like a slave if he doesn't reckon himself to be free. You will be held under the power of your sin if you don't fully invest in the reality that you are free in Christ. And if you are free, then Paul says in Romans 6.12, don't allow sin to reign in your body. If you don't have to obey sin, then don't let sin reign. Then don't obey sin. Fight it right here. Sin, you are dead to me. Flesh, you want me to do that, but you are dead to me. I don't have to obey you. The flesh tries to tell you, you have to obey me. You need me. I am dead unto sin. I am alive unto Christ. I am a child of the living God. I don't need sin. I am not under the authority of sin. So, assume the mindset. Know the flesh is conquered. Number two, know your release in Christ. Know your release in Christ. We talked about this last time in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of Christ, uh, of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit if you are in Christ not only do must you invest in the reality that sin has no power over you but you must also invest in the reality that you are no longer under its guilt and condemnation the flesh wants to and Satan demonic influences want to hold you under the condemnation of your sin they want to tell you because you are tempted to sin you must be a terrible person they want to tell you that because you have yielded to the flesh on this occasion that means you can't conquer the flesh they want to, to, to put into your life the seeds of doubt that make you feel as though you can't do it, that make you feel as though you must yield to temptation that you must yield to sin, that you're just going to lose the battle anyway so why even fight it and then we understand we must understand that there is no condemnation in Christ Guilt is a strong adversary. It is extremely detrimental. Guilt holds us in bondage where there is no bondage. Guilt opens us up to demonic oppression. Guilt causes deep confusion and can lead to spiritual regression. But as we have spoken of for months now, the system in which we operate is not a system of guilt. It's a system of grace. 
You are not obligated to do anything to be right with God. You are right with God because of what Jesus has done for you. And in this case, if in this case uh, you do not, and indeed cannot, in Christ, rest under condemnation. If this is the case, if it is true that your standing with God is not about what you do, but what Christ has done, then you cannot, in Christ, rest under condemnation. Released from the obligations of a set law, released from the guilt of breaking a set law, you are complete in Christ. Point number three, under this second overarching point. First, we need to know what is the flesh and the spirit. We need to assume the mindset. In assuming the mindset, we need to know the flesh is conquered. We need to know your release in Christ. Third, you need to know the consequences of carnality. The word carnality simply means that which pertains to the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 has already told us what those things that pertain to the flesh are. But spiritually speaking, what happens when you indulge in the flesh? What happens when you allow the flesh to reign? Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 8 tell us this. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject unto the law of God, neither indeed can it be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The carnal mind works death. We've also talked about that in James chapter 1 tonight, haven't we? That when lust conceives, it works sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. We spoke already, this does not mean hell. This does not mean that you will go to hell if you ever sin. That's, that's conquered in Christ. What it does mean is that you will have an incapacity to live in the Spirit of God and be led by the Spirit of God as you are yielding to the flesh. To be spiritually minded, however, is life and peace. The carnal mind is opposed to God. What this means is when you're operating in the flesh, you are not pleasing God. You're still saved. You're still an heir of all things in Christ. You are still in Christ and clothed in His righteousness. But they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You are walking out of fellowship with God. And you need to know this. You need to recognize that your flesh is conquered, that you have been released from the obligations of sin, but that you have every capacity to choose a life lived in the flesh. And when you do, you are choosing the consequences of the life lived in the flesh. It will work out in you death. You're spiritually separated from fellowship with God. You are cut off from the power of the Spirit of God to operate within you as He would desire to do. The fourth and final point under assuming the mindset. You need to know your flesh is conquered. You need to know your release in Christ. You need to know the consequences of carnality. Finally, you need to know what is at stake. When you consider the dangers of grieving the Spirit, of cutting off the power of the Spirit within you, the true implication of such action, you say, well, if we're going to heaven, does it really matter anyway? Absolutely it does. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 to 18. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The struggles and temptations of this life, the struggle that we face with the flesh, the temptations of, of the flesh that would seek to convince us that the things of this world are more important than the things of the world that is to come, the sexual indulgences of this world, the emotional indulgences of this world, the material indulgences of this world, these elements are more tangible and therefore they would seek to convince you that they are more real than the ones that we have been promised in the Word of God. And yet the Word of God tells us that these things pale in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in you. And if you can reckon this so in your mind, if you can overcome the flesh by faith and recognize that by denying your flesh today, you are laying up treasure in heaven, then not only will your victory become much more attainable, but it will become truly desirable. 
You won't want to indulge the flesh if you know that by indulging the flesh you will lose eternal reward. You won't want to indulge the flesh. You will want to follow the Spirit if you reckon that by following the Spirit you will receive some eternal blessings that you would not otherwise receive. Sin promises temporary material pleasures, cheap copies of the spiritual blessings which are in Christ. And it is easy to refuse the cheap promises of sin when you know by faith that you have something so much more eternal, so much more real, so much more tangible waiting for you in heaven. We might liken this to a person who says, no thank you to the super expensive dessert at a restaurant because he knows that he has his wife's homemade pie back home. The dessert at the restaurant might be good, but it costs way too much and it truly pales in comparison to the homemade pie. But if he eats the dessert at the restaurant, he will lose his capacity to fully enjoy the pie because he will be too full. So he forgoes the expensive restaurant dessert because he knows that he has something better in every way waiting for him at home. Within this mindset, you must grow to be convinced by faith that what God has promised you in heaven is so much better than what this earth promises to you. What this earth promises is far too expensive and it's not even as good as what you have waiting for you at home. What you have waiting for you in heaven. Do you believe that with all your heart? Do you truly believe that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be within, uh, re revealed within us? Do you truly believe that there is a glory in heaven that you want to attain unto? That there are rewards in heaven that you will receive if you deny your flesh today that are far more enjoyable than whatever the flesh is telling you it wants to do? That if you will deny yourself today, you will receive tenfold in the world to come. How to overcome the flesh. Know what the flesh is and what the spirit is. We talked about that. Galatians 5. Assume the mindset. You've got to know your flesh is conquered. You've got to know that you are released from it in Christ. Released from guilt. Released from condemnation. Released from its authority. You have to know that the consequences of carnality, that it will work out in you death. And you have to know what's at stake. Eternal glory, eternal riches. Third and finally, you need to fight this war daily. The flesh will weaken as you feed the spirit. It's like an animal. If you feed the spirit, the spirit will strengthen and the flesh will, will be starved. If you feed the flesh, then the flesh will strengthen and the spirit will starve. But lest you forget, the flesh is only a part of the problem, right? The flesh is a daily battle. But we fight it on a spiritual plane. There are demonic forces seeking to allure you and confuse you. There's a world bombarding your senses with allurements. And so how do we fight this war? Well, we fight this war by staying in fellowship, by putting on the armor of God, and by praying. Staying in fellowship, putting on the armor of God, and by praying. First, stay in fellowship. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You want to win this war? Stay in fellowship with God. When sin comes up, confess it, forsake it, get right with God. Secondly, put on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18 tell us what the armor of God is. That we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers. And that if we will put on the armor of God, specifically, the scriptures tell us, having our loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the Word of God. If we will put those on every day, if we will assume a victorious stance, we will find victory in Christ. And then that third and final one, pray, pray, pray. The final verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication for all saints. Scriptures tell us that if you want to win this battle, first assume the mindset, the reality that you have victory, and then wake up in the morning and say, the victory is mine, so I'm going to be right with God, I'm going to stay right with God. I am going to assume the armor of God. I am going to fight this battle through faith and through, through certainly uh, assuming the reality of my salvation. That's the mindset. And then I'm going to, to have faith, and I'm going to, to, to um, live as unto Christ, unto righteousness. I am going to be girt about with truth. I am going to take the word of God and I am going to stand in the day of battle. And as I am doing all of this, I am praying with all prayer and supplication. I am praying, praying, praying. Praying for God's capacity to overcome the flesh. Praying and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Praying that God would put a hedge about us and to protect us from spiritual influence and attack. Praying that God would bring people into our lives that can encourage us to do right in the Lord. Praying, laying our anxieties and our fears at the feet of Jesus Christ. And if we will take this list and we, will, and we appropriate it into our lives, we will have victory. But pastor, you don't know my sin. It doesn't matter. But pastor, it's really powerful. God is more powerful still. And you have already been freed from its power. So let's just live in the reality of its freedom. Let's close in prayer.